hi everyone. I'm Andrew Anthony. I'm a gastroenterologist at Greenwich Hospital. And uh, I'll be talking to you today about common causes of upper abdominal pain. Uh, since we're doing it in the Zoom format, um, I'm gonna ask that if you can type into the question bar, any questions that you may have that comes up during the presentation, and we can uh, hopefully get to those at the end. I saved some time for that. Um, and we'll go from there. So this is a, an image of the anatomy of the upper GI tract. Here's the mouth. And as you go down, this uh, is a tube that leads. Excuse me, uh, Andrew. Yep. Uh, yeah, go ahead. You're, you're not sharing your screen. Oh, I'm not. Okay. All right. Let me share the screen. Thank you for that. How is that? Is that any better? Yes, it is. Great. So this was the image that I was looking at. And here we have the mouth and the muscular tube that uh, leads down into the stomach is called the esophagus. And as you get down here to where the, sort of at the level of the diaphragm here, you have where the esophagus enters the stomach. And there's a valve here that's called the lower esophageal sphincter. We'll talk about that later on. This here is the stomach and it passes next into the small bowel and small intestine. And this first part is called the duodenum or duodenum. So there are many causes of upper abdominal pain. It's one of the most common reasons why I uh, see patients in the office. And today I wanna to talk about some of the more common reasons for upper abdominal pain. And specifically we'll focus on these top four reflux, ulcers, gallstones, and celiac disease. So we'll start by talking about GERD or gastroesophageal reflux disease. So what's GERD? Uh, this is often called acid reflux or heartburn. There are a number of names for it, um, but essentially it's the sensation that you get when uh, acid is refluxing back from the stomach and uh, coming up into the esophagus. This is typically happening when there's a relaxation of that muscle, that valve uh, that I mentioned before, um, uh, that controls the reflux of contents from the stomach back up into the esophagus. It's one of the most commonly diagnosed disorders uh, within gastroenterology. And about one in five uh, adults have GERD at one time or another. There are several risk factors that we think of when we're talking about reflux. Um, some of the more uh, notable ones include obesity, tobacco use, uh, hiatal hernia, and a family history of, of acid reflux. It's also very common uh, in the setting of pregnancy. I mentioned hiatal hernia, so I just wanted to point out what that sort of is. And here's another image. We have the, that tube, the esophagus, leading down to the stomach. And here you can see, this is the hiatal hernia sac, and essentially the top part of the stomach can be pulled up above the diaphragm. This is the diaphragm here. And that top part of the stomach can get pulled up into the chest cavity. And what it does is this can contribute to acid reflux because that valve is now up here. So you don't have the reinforcement from the diaphragm helping that, that valve, that sphincter, to keep uh, control of the, of the separation between the esophagus and the stomach. And you end up with increased uh, acid reflux. 
So what are the symptoms of GERD or, or reflux? So the main, the main presentation is a burning sensation uh, in the upper part of the abdomen uh, or the lower part of the chest that tends to rise upwards towards the top of the chest and even towards the back of the mouth. That's the classic symptom, but people can, can uh, experience GERD in many different ways. Uh, sometimes people say that they regurgitate food. Um, sometimes people complain of abdom pure abdominal pain. Sometimes only have people only have chest pain. People may experience a uh, hoarseness in their voice or some sort of change in their voice or a sore throat. Um, sometimes people also have uh, nausea or even vomiting. And people may have the sensation that there's something stuck in their throat or that they have trouble swallowing and food maybe getting sort of hung up and it's, it's going down. Um, so there's a lot of different reasons, uh, different uh, symptoms that people may have. And it can be difficult to tell what exactly is going on. So when should you come to see me or come see a gastroenterologist? Um, really, it's if, if symptoms are lasting a long time, that's one of the most common reasons why people may come to see uh, a GI doctor. Um, but there are a few that I would say need more urgent medical care um, and should be assessed by a gastroenterologist. So anytime that people are having trouble swallowing, like I said, food getting stuck or the sensation that they're getting hung up as they're going down. Um, anytime people are complaining of chest pain, just because um, we want to evaluate and see if this is truly a GI problem or if, if maybe there's some cardiac workup that needs to be done. Um, anytime patients are vomiting blood is certainly concerning. Um, but similarly, people may vomit black or dark material that looks sort of like used coffee grounds. Um, that would be suspicious for old blood. And so that should also be evaluated uh, more urgently. Anytime that you're seeing blood in the stool, obviously a, a gastroenterologist uh, is going to wanna to know about that. But similarly, if you're seeing black tarry stools, that's a reason to go see a doctor right away uh, rather than trying to manage these symptoms on your own at home. Uh, and finally, uh, if you're losing weight, we would want you to come in uh, more urgently. So how is reflux or GERD diagnosed? Primarily based on symptoms and risk factors that we sort of already spoke about. Um, but there are cases where we might wanna do additional testing. And usually this is going to be uh, an upper end in the form of an upper endoscopy. And this here is sort of a graphic of the basics of an upper endoscopy. This is a uh, routine outpatient procedure um, that we do under sedation. So usually there's an anesthesiologist involved um, and patients get medications through the vein to put them to sleep. And once they're sleeping, I take a small camera at the end of a thin flexible tube that you could see here. And I go into the mouth, down the esophagus, and a complete exam goes into the stomach and into the first part of the intestines, that's the duodenum. Um, but for acid reflux, we're sort of focusing on the esophagus and the, the top part of the stomach. And we're looking for changes that um, are consistent with reflux disease, including uh, inflammation of the esophagus or esophagitis. This is a quick procedure. It takes about five or 10 minutes in the, uh, either in the office or in a surgical center. Um, since you get anesthesia, you'd... Uh, uh, have somebody pick you up, but you'd be able to leave after uh, you know an hour or two. So it's an outpatient procedure, very safe, very routine. And on the other slide, I did mention a pH study. So uh, sometimes we need to measure and quantify the uh, acid level and the acid exposure of the lower esophagus. And we can do that with a pH study as well. That's sort of less common and uh, but it is some, something that we use on occasion. So what are treatments for GERD? The first thing that I always tell my patients are to work on lifestyle modifications. So these are things that you can do and many patients even have done this before they even come to see me. Um, but these are things like avoiding eating meals late at night 
That's one of the most effective ways to manage GERD, especially for patients who have symptoms that are worse in the evening or in the middle of the night. Um, so we recommend that, that patients uh, not eat at least two hours um, before laying down. Um, ideally even three hours, but that can be pretty difficult um, with most people's schedules. Um, similarly, uh, raising the head of the bed, either with uh, pillows or with a wedge or by putting something underneath the mattress, this can sometimes, uh, that elevation can help prevent the acid and stomach contents from refluxing back up uh, through the esophageal sphincter, through that valve and into the lower part of the esophagus. We can uh, recommend that patients avoid certain foods that may worsen their symptoms. I always like to uh, encourage patients to keep a diary and see uh, if there's anything in particular that bothers, uh, bothers them or makes their symptoms worse. Um, since every patient is different. Um, but classically, foods that may worsen reflux disease include things like coffee, uh, spicy foods, chocolate, uh, citrus, uh, tomato, alcohol, and, and mint. So trying to minimize that, I mean, it's a lot of things, but uh, whatever you can do to try to minimize that is probably going to be helpful. So if anybody is smoking and has GERD, I would recommend they stop smoking. Um, and if uh, patients are overweight, uh, then I would also recommend uh, losing weight. All, that will also help um, with the symptoms of reflux. The next step would be medication options. Um, so there's lots of medications out there. Again, I, I often see patients who come in uh, already having taken some or even all of these. Uh, but sort of starting at the lowest level, we have things like antacids. Uh, these are things like Tums or Maalox, Mylanta. Uh, these can be helpful certainly for uh, short term once the symptoms are already there. Um, and if you're not having frequent symptoms, this may be a good option for you. The next step up is uh, histamine blockers. These are H2 blockers. Um, the main one that we use these days is Pepsid or Famotidine. Um, and this is a good medication. It can also be used sort of on an as-needed basis, although I have plenty of patients who are on these medications on a daily basis or even a twice daily basis, and these will help to suppress acid. Similarly, the, the kind of final step up are proton pump inhibitors, and these are slightly newer, although they've been around for a while now. Um, and they suppress acid in a different way. Um, and we think of them as suppressing acid in a more potent way. These medications should be used on a daily basis. And ideally they're uh, administered about 30 to 60 minutes before the first meal of the day. These are things like pantoprazole or protonix, omeprazole or prilosec and esomeprazole or mexidine. When patients are not responding to any of the um, treatments that we mentioned, and we're, we're confirmed maybe with a pH study that, there's, that this is truly the reason for their symptoms, then sometimes we would recommend referral to a surgeon uh, for a surgery. Um, the main surgeries for this type of problem are called fundoplications. And there are different types and different degrees of, of doing this, but essentially uh, here we would wrap the, uh, put a wrap using the top part of the stomach around the gastroesophageal junction to help reinforce that valve where, uh, where that valve is the lower esophageal sphincter and help prevent a reflux of acid into the esophagus. We often use this in patients who are younger, um, who will have a, over a lifetime, will have a longer term uh, acid exposure. So what are some of the complications of GERD? Um, we sort of touched a little bit on the first one, which is the most common sort of complication. And this is erosive esophagitis. So this is inflammation of the lower part of the esophagus from continued acid exposure. So this is something that's visible on an endoscopy, and that's why we're often doing an upper endoscopy 
um, to look for these types of changes. This is something that's um, that's certainly reversible with uh, medications like the panto, like the uh, proton pump inhibitors. Esophageal strictures are narrowings of the esophagus. Um, again, from long-standing, uh, this is usually from years of, of uh, untreated acid exposure, um, and it can cause uh, trouble swallowing um, and, and other problems. Barrett's esophagus uh, is another complication that's related to acid reflux, and here we get changes in the uh, cells that line the lower part of the esophagus and uh, that slightly will increase the risk of uh, esophageal cancer. So that's why it's important to know about um, and monitor going forward with uh, repeat endoscopy uh, every couple of years. Um, all of that being said, the majority of people who have GERD uh, don't actually have any of these complications, which is good. So normally I would stop here and ask questions, um, maybe take a moment, write any questions down, um, and I'll try to get back to them at the end. Um, but I'm going to move on to peptic ulcer disease now. So what is peptic ulcer disease? Um, ulcers can form anywhere in the GI tract. Here we're talking about ulcers that develop in the lining of the stomach. Uh, or the first or second portions of the uh, intestine, uh, the duodenum. Um, and they occur when acid is uh, eroding uh, the lining of the GI tract. There are two major causes of uh, ulcer disease, and these include uh, H. pylori, Helicobacter pylori, which is a bacteria, and uh, NSAIDs, or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. These are things like Advil, Aleve, Motrin, Naproxen. And go back, sorry. Um, peptic ulcer disease can affect, again, a lot, it's a very common problem, it can affect about 15 million people in the US. Risk factors, uh, aside from the NSAIDs and the having that bacteria that I mentioned, would be uh, alcohol and tobacco use. In terms of symptoms of peptic ulcer disease, certainly a lot of people have ulcers and don't know about it. They have no symptoms uh, until they develop a complication, um, which we can get into later. Um, but in terms of the classic symptoms of ulcers, it's typically pain in the upper abdomen called the epigastrium, uh, right underneath the top part of the chest. And usually gastric ulcers, so ulcers in the stomach um, are going to uh, present with pain after eating. And ulcers in the duodenum in the small intestine usually present with pain several hours after eating. So um, on an empty stomach, essentially. Other symptoms of ulcers uh, include bloating, nausea or vomiting, the sensation that you get full very quickly after eating, and having decreased appetite or no appetite. When should you see a doctor uh, if you're concerned about ulcers? Um, again, if symptoms are persisting, it's always a good idea to come in and get things checked out. Um, other than that, it's going to be similar types of uh, concerning features. So if you're vomiting blood or a dark coffee ground looking material, or if you're having black tarry stool, all of that is uh, concerning for bleeding, and we would want you to come in more urgently. Uh, also, if you have severe or sudden onset abdominal pain, we'd uh, certainly want to see you quickly. So how is uh, peptic ulcer disease diagnosed? Um, the diagnosis is formally made on an upper endoscopy as well. So that's why I had went over that before. Um, now we're, really in the stomach or in the duodenum, and we can directly visualize an ulcer. So this here on the right side of the screen shows a small, very small clean-based uh, ulcer um, with some surrounding redness and inflammation. And uh, that's basically an uncomplicated ulcer right there. So there's no evidence of bleeding or uh, blood vessels or anything else. 
I mean, we find when we see this on the endoscopy, uh, not infrequently. Um, the other thing that we will do during an endoscopy is take biopsies to look for H. pylori. So there are different ways to detect the bacteria that contributes to, that can contribute to ulcers. Um, biopsies during the endoscopy is one way. Breath test, uh, looking for H. pylori, or a stool test, looking for H. pylori, are other ways to diagnose the bacteria itself. So a little bit more about Helicobacter pylori. It's very common. It's a common bacteria. It's found in the environment um, and can be found in the digestive tract. And the vast majority of people may not have any symptoms. Um, but what it can do is it can uh, cause increased acid and uh, cause inflammation to the lining of the stomach and, uh, and end up resulting in uh, ulcer formation. And it's also been linked um, to an increased risk of gastric cancer. So that's why whenever we see this uh, bacteria, uh, we do like to treat it, even though it's a very a sort of small increased risk. Um, we we want to make sure that we're treating it and then actually testing to make sure it's effectively treated and has uh, resolved. So what are the treatments for ulcers? Again, there's... Uh, some amount that we can do with uh, lifestyle modifications. So certainly limiting alcohol, uh, not smoking. And in, in discussions with your doctors, of course, uh, considering to stop uh, medications that may predispose to ulcers, aspirin, Advil, Aleve, naproxen. Um, but after that, you're really looking at medications um, that reduce the amount of acid in the stomach. And these are the same medications that we mentioned. Um, but really, once you have developed an ulcer, we would really go to that more potent medication of the uh, proton pump inhibitor, the PPIs. And if you have H. pylori, uh, we would also put you on medications to treat that. So that since it's a bacteria, uh, we would be looking at antibiotics. Uh, because it can be a sort of a hardy bacteria and can be difficult to treat, we usually use at least two different antibiotics uh, in conjunction with the acid suppressing medications. And it ends up being a two week course, a 14 day course. Okay. So post-treatment follow-up, uh, ulcers in the stomach, we often check and repeat endoscopy to see if they uh, have healed over. Um, usually ulcers in the duodenum, we are more comfortable leaving and treating with just the medications uh, and don't require a repeat endoscopy. Um, and like I've said, for H. pylori, we, it is important to test and make sure that we've eradicated the bacteria so that we definitely know that we've reduced that risk uh, going forward. And again, that doesn't necessarily have to be an upper endoscopy. Um, it can be a simple sort of uh, breath test or stool test. So what are the complications of ulcers? Uh, anemia, low blood count, uh, bleeding. So all those uh, symptoms that I mentioned before, of dark tarry stools or vomiting up blood. Um, that's, that's a common way that patients may present. Um, and that's how we find out that they may be bleeding from an ulcer. Uh, some of the more concerning uh, problems would be perforation, which would be a basically a hole somewhere in the lining of the GI tract um, that would require surgery, um, generally require surgery, or obstruction, which is a blockage. So especially when you have ulcers sort of towards the bottom part of the stomach uh, where it meets the small intestine, um, you can get a lot of swelling and inflammation in that area. And if it blocks off the entrance of the stomach into the small intestine, you can get a blockage. And again, that, that could require certainly hospitalization and potentially even further treatments such as surgery. So again, I'm gonna take one minute, we'll change gears. If you wanna put a question in, um, I will get back to that uh, at the end of the session. I will uh, move on to the next part, which is going to be gallstones. So 
here's an image of, again, on the right side, we have the uh, GI tract. This is the esophagus coming down. Here's the stomach. Um, and this is all small bowel. This is the large intestine. And this right here and on the right side of the patient's body is the liver. And that little green area right here underneath the liver is the gallbladder. And this is the gallbladder in a different view. The gallbladder itself is right here. And these are sort of some of the bile ducts. And it's the bile duct that leads into the small intestine, into the duodenum. So actually, I'll go back here for one more second, and I'll just say that. So the gallbladder is an organ, again, it's sitting underneath the liver, but it stores bile and releases bile. And bile is needed um, to help with digestion. Um, so bile is drained from the liver and from the gallbladder through the bile ducts and empties into the intestine. Uh, and that's where it can act on the food bolus that um, is traveling through the GI tract um, and help with digestion. So occasionally the, the bile and the cholesterol in the bile specifically can thicken uh, to form kind of this thicker, uh, substance and, and, or these small fine crystals and eventually uh, form larger stones. These are called gallstones. And whether you have sludge or stones, um, any of this can cause irritation and end up uh, blocking or clogging the gallbladder. Um, and sometimes it can even affect the liver or the pancreas. Uh, about 20% of people have gallstones, so it's pretty common. Um, but only a third of these uh, patients will actually have uh, pain. So a lot of these are, a lot of people with gallstones find out because they're getting some sort of imaging for another reason. Um, of those, uh, about a, very few people will have complications from gallstones. So some uh, risk factors for gallstones are uh, age over 40, uh, females are at an increased risk. Uh, anyone with rapid weight gain or weight loss can be at an increased risk. And again, pregnancy can put you at increased risk of gallstone formation. So again, most people have no symptoms, um, but uh, the classic sort of uh, presentation or symptoms of uh, gallstone disease is known as biliary colic. And basically this is severe pain in the uh, right upper quadrant of the abdomen. Um, so that's where, where it's located and that's where you typically feel the pain. Uh, sometimes it can be more towards the center. Um, that's why there's a bit of an overlap when trying to figure out if, if it may be gallstone disease or ulcers. Uh, the pain may radiate. Um, it often radiates to the back or to the right shoulder and it can be associated with nausea and vomiting. Typically, the pain for gallstone disease is happening uh, after eating a meal, specifically a fatty meal. Usually um, lasts around 30 minutes, um, but uh, it doesn't usually persist for like hours on end. Complicated gallstone disease um, includes things like infections of the gallbladder uh, called cholecystitis infections of the bile duct that either lead from the liver or lead to the intestine. Um, that's called cholangitis. Uh, gallstone pancreatitis. So this is an inflammation of the pancreas because that pancreas has a connection sort of in the same area uh, into the intestines. Uh, and ileus, uh, when you can get a blockage or uh, slowdown of the uh, GI tract in the setting of gallstones. So when should you see a doctor for gallstone disease? Typically when you're having recurrent episodes of uh, pain that is consistent with biliary colic. So if you're getting this uh, multiple times with when you're having pain there, you should, you should really see a doctor. Um, the other thing would be any time of you're having complicated gallstone disease. So 
specifically anytime you're having this pain along with fevers uh, or jaundice, which is yellowing of the skin or the eyes. Uh, that would suggest that either there's an infection going on in the gallbladder or that there's a blockage of the uh, bile duct um, and maybe even an infection of the bile duct. How are gallstones diagnosed? Um, so typically gallstones are best visualized on an abdominal, on an abdominal ultrasound. This is actually an uh, endoscopic ultrasound, uh, but here we have the gallbladder. That's this dark structure. And then this white circle here is a gallstone. And this is just the way that uh, this sort of artifact here is just the way that a gallstone looks on, uh, on ultrasound uh, because of the sound waves. That's the, the best way to diagnose gallstones. Sometimes we can see them on CAT scans, although not always. Um, and we can also usually see them on an MRI. So what are treatments for gallstones? Um, again, a lot of people are have no symptoms um, or have very infrequent symptoms. And sometimes we, we do nothing, we don't do any treatment. Um, but most people that are presenting to doctor's offices or hospitals and are having symptoms of either pain or nausea or vomiting, any of these, uh, and certainly any complicated gallstone disease, uh, they're gonna get surgery. And the surgery to remove the gallbladder is called a cholecystectomy. Um, so this is not something that I do as a gastroenterologist, but uh, a surgeon would remove the gall gallbladder. And again, this is a relatively uh, routine procedure that can often be done uh, in the outpatient setting. We do use some medications, um, specifically ursodiol, to help try to minimize the amount of gallstone formation. Um, but we, but it's it's not a perfect medication, so I, it's it's often not the best way to manage gallstones. Okay, so that's gallstone disease. Um, we'll move on to celiac disease next, and then after that, we should be able to get uh, to some of the questions that you've sent in. So celiac disease, you've probably heard more and more about it. It's becoming more and more common as we learn about the disease itself. Um, but it is an autoimmune disorder uh, where the body is sensitive to gluten, which is a protein that's found in various things like wheat and rye. Um, basically, it's triggering an immune response in the small intestine that ends up uh, causing a lot of inflammation in the lining of the small intestine and the duodenum, um, and symptoms that are associated with that. So it can, it can develop at any age. Um, we often think of it as uh, being diagnosed in younger people, but um, that's, we can diagnose it in anybody. Um, and it's, again, a common problem. It can affect up to one in 100 people worldwide. Risk factors for celiac disease uh, include a fam anybody with a family history of celiac disease, uh, diabetes or other autoimmune problems. So what are the symptoms of celiac disease? There can be a lot. Um, and you can see I've put other symptoms on the side because there are many extra intestinal manifestations, things like uh, rashes and nail changes, joint pains, things like that. Um, but in terms of the GI symptoms, we're talking mostly about abdominal discomfort, abdominal pain, bloating, uh, and diarrhea. So you don't have to have all of these symptoms, um, but that, those are sort of the classic findings. Um, nausea, vomiting, just sort of general malaise, discomfort, these are uh, also associated with celiac disease. So when should you see a doctor? Um, the kind of classic teaching will be if you have abdominal pain and persistent diarrhea that's lasting for you know two weeks or more. Um, 
and or any time that you have any of these symptoms and have family history would be the other reason to see a doctor for further evaluation and potential testing. Well, how is celiac disease diagnosed? Um, I just wanted to mention that it often goes undiagnosed um, because the symptoms are so nonspecific and uh, it can just be a challenge to diagnose. Um, but the way that I typically proceed with testing in, in the majority of patients is starting with a blood test. Um, so there are antibodies that we can check um, and they, there have been advances in that uh, field. So they're, they're pretty good at detecting uh, celiac disease. Um, that being said, we would if I see somebody with celiac disease that I've diagnosed on, bio, on a blood test, I would still proceed with an endoscopy and take biopsies of the small intestine, the duodenum, uh, to confirm that diagnosis. And it's important to tell your doctor if you're taking a gluten-free diet uh, in prior to the testing, because that can change the uh, results. Um, so your doctor may want to either do a different type of test, perhaps even a genetic test, um, or sometimes we will re-challenge people with gluten and then do the testing. But it's important to know either way. What are treatments for celiac disease? So Primarily, the treatment is actually dietary change, so maintaining a strict gluten-free diet. I always recommend that people who are newly diagnosed with celiac disease meet with a nutritionist um, because e even though it sounds simple enough, um, in practice, there's gluten uh, found in a, a whole variety of things that we would not suspect. Uh, lots of different supplements, even different foods or prepared foods that we may think um, would be okay to have end up having gluten in it. Um, so the classic things that we're avoiding are wheat, you know, pastas, breads, um, rye, barley, things like that, beer, um, but even various other products, supplements um, will actually have to be switched out or, or avoided entirely. The other thing to note is that because this is a malabsorptive process uh, and there's inflammation in the small bowel, uh, sometimes people have trouble with different uh, vitamin or nutrient deficiencies and will need to be monitored for that with blood tests uh, and may even need to take supplementation. Um, so that would be the other part to the treatment. So complications of celiac disease, uh, since, since it's sort of is, it's an autoimmune process and it sort of affects more than just the GI tract, there can be a lot of different um, issues, um, especially because with severe celiac disease, you can get some of these nutrient and vitamin deficiencies that will have impacts on uh, other areas, other uh, systems within the body. Um, so malnutrition is a concern, and that's why we want to monitor your vitamin and nutrient levels and supplement uh, these as necessary. Um, infertility, miscarriage, these are problems that could be associated with celiac disease, uh, bone weakness, lactose intolerance, and there is um, an increased risk of small bowel cancers. Um, so these are some of the reasons why it's really important to have a good follow-up with a gastroenterologist um, so that you can be monitored for uh, a variety of complications and um, make sure that you're on top of your nutritional status as well. These are just some uh, resources for celiac disease that I wanted to highlight. And these are references. So a lot of the material that I got is uh, for this presentation is patient specific. Um, so they have really nice figures and they have uh, good ways of explaining things. Um, uh, so things like the Mayo Clinic, uh, Cleveland Clinic have a lot of information um, and uh, JAMA, the journal for, uh, of uh, American Medical Association also has a lot of information that's good for patients. So at this point, 
I want to stop and take a look at some of the questions that may have come up. I'm just going to go back to the beginning in case I need that going forward. So the first question that I see is uh, regarding H. pylori. Um, and the question is, does H. pylori cause GERD? And this is a great question. Um, I think that there's a couple of points to make about it. Um, so first, H. pylori causes ulcers typically in the stomach because that's the environment that the bacteria prefers, an acid uh, environment. Um, so in creating this sort of contributing to this acidic environment, uh, you, can you can have increased acid in the stomach and thereby you can get some increased uh, acid exposure into the esophagus if you're someone who's prone to reflux already. Um, it doesn't necessarily change anything about the lower esophageal sphincter uh, to uh, make you more susceptible to reflux, um, but, uh, but it can increase the acidic environment. Uh, the other thing to note is that uh, anecdotally, some people do note that after, um, actually after treatment of H. pylori, uh, sometimes people say that they, their symptoms may get worse in terms of their acid reflux, not of their ulcers, obviously. Um, so that's just something to note. Um, so hopefully that uh, answers some of your question at least. I'm just gonna look for some other questions. So what does a HIDA scan show? So a HIDA scan is a great question, thank you. Um, HIDA scan is a nuclear medicine test. Um, and basically it shows whether the, it shows how the gallbladder is functioning. Um, and it can also show if there's any uh, blockages. Um, so basically a radioactive tracer will be um, within the biliary system and it will you can quantify how well the gallbladder is contracting um, to see if it's functioning normally or not. Um, that's a specific type of HIDA scan. So they would usually, uh, your doctor would usually order that with, um, with cholecystokinin or CCK. Um, and that's a way to see if, you're, if the symptoms that you're describing are uh, truly from uh, abnormal functioning of the gallbladder. The other thing that it does for someone like, for a gastroenterologist as opposed to a surgeon, uh, so someone like me, uh, it can sometimes give us a hint as to whether there's any blockage of the bile duct itself. Um, so while the gallbladder and gallstones are treated by a surgeon, uh, gastroenterologists get involved frequently because the stones can travel outside of the gallbladder if they're of medium size. So if they're really small, gallstones can pass through the gallbladder, pass through the bile ducts and into the intestines without any problem. Um, if they are really large, just trying to get to the picture, sorry. If they're really large, gall gallstones will get stuck here in the gallbladder and they'll kind of get stuck usually here in the neck of the gallbladder before they can enter into the bile ducts. Um, that's often when people are getting biliary colic or pain. Um, when they're of medium size, they can pass, they can be small enough to pass through here, but large enough that they get stuck somewhere in the bile duct. Um, and that can sometimes be seen on a HIDA scan, although classically we'll see it on an ultrasound or an MRI or a CAT scan. And we, uh, as gastroenterologists, can do a special type of endoscopy to clean out the bile duct. That's called an ERCP. So a few more questions coming in. 
So what kind of complications are associated with dental issues? Um, so these are things like acid, this is in reference to GERD or acid reflux. Um, and you can potentially get one uh, halitosis, bad breath that can be associated with GERD um, and can be sometimes associated uh, with um, cavities actually, so dental caries. Um, from increased acid exposure. And then uh, there can be, that's mostly for the dental issue. Um, and then sometimes you can get some laryngeal reflux and, and end up having that hoarse voice um, that can be due to uh, irritation to the vocal cords from uh, reflux of acid as well. Um, so those are the two main issues. Um, but usually when this happens, it's, I'll see patients who are referred by their dentist or by their uh, ear, nose, and throat physician um, because they have these problems and they don't have another explanation why. Um, and upon further review, it may be that they actually have uh, acid reflux that's contributing to these problems. So uh, the next question that I see is regarding celiac disease. Um, and it's discussing, a, it's a question about into, gluten intolerance um, and how does that fit in? So it's a great question. And whenever I hear about gluten intolerance, I usually like to start from the beginning um, and make sure that I'm, uh, I'm understanding how that diagnosis was made. Um, but the question is going to be, do you have biopsy proven uh, gluten sensitive enteropathy, celiac disease? Um, do you have the antibodies to it? And then once you are on a gluten-free diet, uh, what is the response to that? So these are all things that need to be uh, documented and need to be understood by a physician before they can make that diagnosis. Um, so gluten intolerance, I usually would want to monitor this, these people um, for response to therapy, um, but it is a distinct entity um, and, and it may not have some of the, the uh, complicate, longstanding complications as a uh, true celiac disease. Um, but I'm always hesitant talking about gluten uh, intolerance um, because sometimes we can misdiagnose a gluten, you know, a gluten sensitive enteropathy as gluten intolerance. So it's, it is important to make that sort of distinction. So my short answer is would be, I would still follow up with your uh, gastroenterologist. Uh, I have another question coming in regarding uh, GERD, and this one is asking, how long would you recommend being on a PPI before trying surgery? So uh, good question. Um, again, I would refer you to your gastroenterologist to make that decision jointly, and it may pay also to even meet a surgeon. Um, but the general principles I'm happy to go through with you now. Um, so as I said before, PPIs are very common. They're generally very safe um, and accessible. So people will often come to me after having been on a PPI for uh, two weeks, because I think if you read, should have read the box that a lot of these proton pump inhibitors come with, um, they say, take it for no longer than 14 days and then see your gastroenterologist. Um, so I, I, I really don't jump uh, I don't take surgery lightly, um, especially for something like uh, reflux disease. Um, so you have to sort of be the right, um, in the right scenario to warrant a surgery in my mind. Um, and it's more about what else is going on. So um, your age, your other risk factors, do you have Barrett's esophagus or not? Um, and, and what are your symptoms? Um, I think that that's probably going to be the most important thing. You know, we wanna make sure that you do it, we're doing it for the right reasons. And then if, if the answer is yes, then the next question is, okay, as you said, 
uh, how, what sorts of treatments have you tried? So if you're talking about surgery, uh, I'm assuming that you've done all of the lifestyle modifications already um, and they haven't helped and you've tried all of the uh, other medications and they haven't helped. So you're on PPIs. So once I have somebody on a PPI, um, first I would want to maximize the dose. Um, so we can also, we can often uh, increase the dose to twice daily dosing. We want to make sure that we're taking it sort of in the ideal fashion, 30 to 60 minutes, minutes before your first meal of the day. Uh, and, uh, after that, I might even, I usually even switch people to a different type of PPI. So it's still within the same class, but people often get better uh, response to therapy from one medication over another. And that we don't really understand why, but, um, but if it works, it works. And I would rather uh, try all of the options available before doing any surgery. The other thing that I would say is, so, so I would try that probably for a few more weeks um, and uh, ideally a total of at least a month. Uh, and then I would also, uh, after that, I would add on the Pepsid uh, and again, maximize that in terms of acid suppression. So that might be another couple of weeks. And then depending on the patient, I, you may be someone that I put on, a, um, uh, on the schedule for a, a pH study to really quantify the acid exposure and document that we that this is the reason for the symptoms, um, unless we see visible esophagitis, um, which would imply that this was truly from GERD. Um, once all of that is done, that's when I would sort of refer to a surgeon to discuss the options. And you know, these days there are other options. Um, I didn't want to, it's not really within the scope of this talk, but there are some endoscopic um, procedures that, that we can do uh, to help uh, do sort of a, a less invasive um, reinforcement of that lower esophageal sphincter. Um, and that could be an option as well. So I will wait another couple of minutes to see if there are any additional questions. I wanna take the time to thank you all for showing up and listening and uh, asking your excellent questions. Okay, this is a great question. Um, is it okay for people to be on PPIs for years? So it's a great question. It's a difficult question. Um, you know, there's no um, uh, there's no right or wrong answer to this. Um, my approach to so so a little backstory for everybody: PPIs um, are often in the medical literature and and sometimes actually in the in just the newspapers and the news. Um, and they've been implicated as to causing many different problems. Um, things ranging from uh, infections of the colon, C. diff, uh, to dementia, to renal kidney disease, um, all sorts of things. Um, usually these are large scale population-based studies that are sort of drawing um, correlations between people on these medications and various uh, problems that these people may have. Um, and the reason why we can, why people do that is because it's such a common medication that there are a lot of people um, to study. Um, and they've been around for a, a good amount of time at this point. Um, usually after you see one or two of those studies, there's usually another one or two that are saying the opposite uh, of that thing, that they know they don't cause these things. So I'm always a little bit, um, cautious in, in interpreting these new studies because you wonder if there's gonna be another one coming um, that's gonna say something different. Um, the way that I approach PPI, extended long-term PPI use is, um, is this. It's if you have a sh very strong indication to be on a proton pump inhibitor, for example, if you have Barrett's esophagus, which uh, can increase your risk for esophageal cancer. 
um, then I would say that you should be on it, just like you'd be on other medications, even if they have side effects, you know, for your diabetes or for your uh, heart disease. Um, if you have no good reason to be on it, so you have some heartburn, but you don't have esophagitis, your heartburn is mild, um, then I would say, okay, maybe we should try to get you off of that as quickly as possible. Um, if, if we have a reasonable reason to be on it, that, which is most people, then what I would say is we should try to get you onto the lowest possible dose and eventually try to get you onto, um, uh, onto maybe a Pepsid if possible. But if you need the medication, then um, again, it's an individual decision based on risks and benefits and alternatives. Um, but usually uh, I would say it's okay to be on, certainly for the months to you know, even few years type period, um, if that's what, what helps. Um, but that is uh, a reason to talk about some of the other options like surgeries, um, if you're the right person. So the short answer is, is probably yes, it's fine. Um, but if you don't need it, then um, try to minimize the dose. Uh, so another sort of similar question. Um, so PPIs uh, and bone density. Um, yeah, so I, I didn't go through an exhaustive list, but definitely um, those are, that's one of the problems that people have uh, implicated, that, that PPIs have been implicated in. And there, there may be truth to that, yes. Um, I, I would say sort of what I said before, which is if you need it, you sort of need it um, and try to make sure that you're doing everything else for your bone health um, and that you're taking the medication, you know, in conjunction with your gastroenterologist and maybe your endocrinologist or your primary care provider. Um, but, uh, but again, and again, trying to get to this, the lowest possible dose. But again, if, if you need the medication, um, you may, you may have to, take that into account and just take the medication. Um, but these are really good questions and it's, and it's not easy, you know, there's no one right answer for every single person. So that's why it's important to have that relationship with your doctors and um, bring up these concerns um, and, and, and make those decisions together so that, you know, you have all of the information uh, and, and have all of your questions answered before you start uh, or before you continue uh, to take a medication. Okay. Any one last burning question? All right. So I think that's it again. Thank everybody for, for your time. Um, and uh, hopefully you've gotten some information out of this and uh, can use it going forward, use it to talk with your doctors, bring up any concerns that you may have. Uh, and make sure to follow up if, um, if you have anything else that you think needs attention. Uh, thank you and have a good day.